I was asked a strange question today. The question was, the reason people are not happy is because they're looking for happiness. If they didn't look for happiness, they might be happy. The implication being, if you gave up hope for a better happiness than what you had, then you'd be content with what you got, which is a pretty miserable teaching, because it really does wipe out all possibility of hope. And it suggests that our efforts to find happiness are totally doomed, which is not the Buddha's approach at all. One of the reasons we bow down to the Buddha so much is because he teaches us to have respect for something inside ourselves, our desire for true happiness, something that's worthy of respect. And he teaches us to find it in ways that are also worthy of respect. You look at the different factors of the path. They're all honorable things. Virtue, concentration, discernment. These are noble qualities of mind. And the happiness we're looking for is a happiness that's mature. As the Buddha said, wisdom starts with the, the question, what when I do it will lead to long-term welfare and happiness? The wisdom there is one seeing that it's up to your actions. In other words, happiness isn't just going to come floating by. And two, long term is better than short term. It sounds pretty obvious, but most people don't think about long term at all. If they think about it, they dismiss it pretty quickly, going for the short term instead. And as the Buddha said, the way to find happiness is not only just to ask that question, or to develop wisdom is not only to ask that question, but also to ask the right people, people who've contemplated life and developed good qualities with themselves in order to find happiness. In other words, you look for people who look like they're reliable. I mean, happiness is such a big issue in life, and yet the way a lot of people go about it is pretty haphazard. They see somebody who's rich or famous powerful. They think, well, that must be where happiness lies. And they don't look carefully enough to say, are those people really happy? I mean, you look at the people who are rich and famous and wealthy in our society, and they may have an easier time of things than most of us, but it's not really the recipe for happiness. So you look for the right people and you ask the right question. What, when I do it, will lead to long-term welfare and happiness? And then you think about long-term. One of the qualities of long-term happiness is that it not creates suffering for other people. Because if it creates suffering for other people, after all, they love themselves. And they're not going to be willing to give up their happiness so that you can have yours. So it means that they will probably try to destroy your happiness if it depends on harming them. So from wisdom comes compassion, and then from compassion comes a quality called purity. You actually check your actions, your thoughts, your words and deeds. First look at what you expect. What come about is what you're going to do, because you realize that your actions do make the difference. And so what do you expect out of your actions? If you expect that something you do or say or think is going to cause harm, don't do it. This could be harm to other people, or harm to yourself, or harm to both. You just don't do it. Find some way of talking yourself out of doing it. If you don't foresee any harm, well, go ahead and do it. And then while you're doing it, watch for the results that may come up, because in some cases the results are pretty immediate. This is in line with the Buddhist principle that the results of our actions can either come immediately or over time, or both. So you check to see what are the immediate results. 
If you see that you actually are causing harm, you stop. If you don't see any harm, go ahead. Then when you're done, contemplate the long-term results of that action. And if you see that in spite of your expectations and in spite of what you saw earlier, you actually did cause harm, then you resolve not to repeat that mistake and you go talk it over with someone who is more advanced on the path. And if you don't see that you've created any harm, you take pride in the fact that you're advancing on the path. That, the Buddha said, is how we purify our actions, by examining them again and again and again like that. You might say that oh, requires an awful lot of attention. Well, if anything in the world is worthy of a lot of attention, it's your actions. You're the one that's responsible, and you're the one who's going to be reaping the results. So you want to be very careful about what you do and say and think, and learn from your mistakes. So in this search for happiness, we're developing wisdom and compassion and purity. These are all good qualities. And the happiness that results is solid. So you want to bring those qualities into your meditation, because meditation is a very direct training in all three of those, raising them to a higher level. I mean, you develop some wisdom and compassion and purity in your outside actions. It's interesting to note that when the Buddha first taught his son, these were the teachings he gave him. And the teachings go from outside actions into your actions of the mind. Because in many ways it's easier to see your outside actions and it's easier to see the harm of outside actions. But the training isn't complete and you take it until you take it inside, because the mind is the source of all these things. This is another reason why we bow down to the Buddha and show him a lot of respect, because he showed us that our minds have a lot of power, and we should respect that power. So we need to train them. We develop mindfulness, which is the ability to keep something in mind. In other words, remembering that you want to gain some control of your mind, and you want to look at it in the right way so you can step back from it and see it with some objectivity. So we start with something simple like the breath. It doesn't have too many features, but it does have the ability to be adjusted. So you can adjust it so it's long or short, deep or shallow, cool or warm. Notice how the breathing affects your experience of the body here in the present moment. And if you don't like the effect it's having, you can change. This is right in line with those principles on, on purity. and thought something's not going well in the meditation, it can either be the result of past actions or your present actions. Well, you can't go back and undo your past actions, but you can adjust your present actions, which include things like how do you conceive the breath and where are you focusing, how are you focusing, how much pressure are you putting on. If you put on too much, the Buddha said it's like holding a quail in your hand and squeezing it and it's going to die. If not enough pressure. It's like holding it so loosely that it flies away. So you've got to find just the right amount to keep you here, but not to put undue pressure on your blood vessels or your nerves. So there are lots of ways you can approach being with the breath in the present moment. And as you get more and more sense of what you're doing, you begin to see that you, your actions here in the present moment have a lot of power. In fact, in the Buddha's analysis, he said, even though we may have some bad actions coming up in the past that are going to influence the present moment, the question of whether we're actually going to suffer from those or not, that depends on our present actions, which is good news. Otherwise, we'd just be stuck with whatever comes up and have no way out. But the fact is that our experience of the present moment is a combination of the results of past actions and our present actions and the results of our present actions. And it's the present actions that can make us suffer or not, so those are the ones we want to focus on. We're here with the breath, so we get into the present moment and know we're in the frame of the present moment. And that's when you begin to see the mind in the present moment, 
as I said last night, it's like seeing the mind behind the scenes. Or seeing it from the side, you might say. When you go into a movie theater, you, either you can sit in a chair facing the screen, and it's pretty easy to very quickly to get involved in the story. But if you go and sit on the side of the movie theater and look across, what do you see? You see a beam of light flickering and colors flickering on the screen, and you see a lot of people laughing or crying or whatever in response to those colors, and you begin to see this is pretty ridiculous. It's just flashes of color. Well, staying with the breath gives you that perspective on the mind in the present moment, so you can begin to see what is the mind doing right now. That's causing an undue burdens, undue stress. What can you do to stop? So you're taking responsibility for your happiness, and you're learning how to look for your happiness in a mature way, a way that develops wisdom, compassion, purity, all the good qualities of the mind. And this is a way of looking for happiness that actually does get results. The Buddha was not the sort of person who says, well, I'll just kind of content myself with what I got. As I said, you, you can learn how to content yourself with your physical surroundings, because otherwise if you get too worked up about having things just so outside, it actually weakens you. But as for the internal qualities of the mind, if you find that you're thinking in ways or have mental qualities that are actually getting in the way of true happiness, you can't rest content with those. Or even if you've developed some skill in learning how to take charge of your happiness, if you haven't gone to the very end, he keeps saying, well, don't be content with where you are. There's better, because it really does get really good. So this idea that just making yourself content will be enough to make you happy, the Buddha would have had no use for that at all. True happiness is possible. As you said, it's a happiness that's deathless. No aging, no illness, no, no death, no sorrow, no lamentation, nothing to criticize from any angle. It's there. It's possible. And it can be done through this path, your search for happiness, your search to understand what suffering is, why you're causing it, and the realization that you can abandon the cause and bring suffering to an end. It's a very hopeful kind of teaching. And it's not just an empty hope. Many people have followed this path in the past and said, yes, it does work. And they're amazed at the results. So if you haven't gotten to the point where you're amazed at the results of your practice, well, there's, there's more, there's better. Maintain that hope, because it's something really worth holding to.